Hey everyone, Kai here. Thanks for joining us for another video. I hope not to have this one run too long, but I wanted to take a moment to talk about 3D printing, and more specifically 3D printed taxidermy. Most of what you'll find about home 3D printing, that is a printer such as this one here that is not going to cost more than a few hundred dollars versus an industrial printer that may be in the thousands is going to be dealing with gaming miniatures. That would be things like this here. This is a gaming miniature that was created or rather designed using an online editor, creation editor, I guess you'd call it, called Hero Forge. This is one of the first minis that I printed that was not complete garbage. This was actually one of the first resin and first 3D prints I completed that was not absolute garbage. Most of them turned out with wobbly bottoms and sagging legs and all of these other horrible things. Even this one I had to sand. This was probably three years ago, four years ago, something like that, but I had to sand this even just to get it straight. And this is one of my first successes of the hundreds of hours of not successes. So I started my venture with 3D printing with gaming miniatures. It's used for tabletop games and even just displays. You can even find stuff out there for people that do different scale railroads. You can print buildings and things like that. Bookcases, which have the shelves that come out. You can set those inside, you know, paint them first and then be able to set them inside, which is convenient because I don't know if you realize this, but painting very tiny things by brush inside of a bookcase, very difficult. One of my other successes, painted with a couple of different colors of paint. This was a horse skeleton. This is meant as a gaming miniature, not for anatomical accuracy, although it's not that bad. I don't want to drop that too much. This is a stock resin. If I held this here and I dropped it, this will shatter. Same with these. This is a stock resin that came with my first printer four printers ago. This will shatter. These are also miniatures, decorative, gaming, whatever you want to call it. But most of what you'll find in YouTube and other sources for learning how to do 3D printing is going to be gaming miniatures because most people are using it for that application. When the pandemic hit, a few of us saw a lot wider application for 3D printing. And we started looking at it for educational purposes. So my major is in outdoor recreation human ecology, which is a lot, kind of a fancy way of saying interpretation, dealing with people, things like a park ranger would do, or an interpreter, park ranger that's not law enforcement specific, but uh, interpreting either natural resources and or cultural resources, which are my two focuses. So I got into trying to learn how to take resources that were difficult to access even before the pandemic and make those accessible at home to homeschool parents, to parents that became homeschool parents because of the pandemic, and to just anybody wanting to enrich their curriculum beyond 
Zoom and books and videos. So you can buy an intro level resin printer. This is a resin printer. There's two main types of home printers available. One is resin, one is an FDM. We'll get into that in future videos, but the main difference is this prints with a liquid. I don't know if you could hear that, it's liquid. And an FDM printer prints with a spool of filament, such as PLA, which is derived from corn byproduct. It's a corn plastic, I guess would be the simplest way to put that. What I started with was resin. More compact, seemed to give much better results because if you look at something like this guy here, every little bump is in there. If this were printed with one of the FDM printers that used plastic filament when I first began several years ago, this would have just a bunch of lines layered on top of each other. It would be very obvious. Even one of the first printers I used, we got a little bit of that. You can kind of see island looking lines here. I don't know if you can see that real well on the camera. This was definitely one of the prints I did when I was learning. It takes quite a few hours when you first start with one of these, especially if you're self-taught to get a passable result. But anyway, we'll talk more about that in future videos. What I want to cover today is kind of where our adventure began and a little bit about where we're at now. And if you would, take the time to like and subscribe to the video and please put in the comments questions you have because follow-up videos on your specific 3D printed taxidermy questions will be a lot of the focus of these videos in the future. I can't share what I know if I don't know what questions you have. I'm not an expert by any means, but I would love to share what I already have done research-wise, trial and error-wise. There's thousands of hours, thousands of dollars of materials, several different printers that I have gone through to get to this point. And I do not feel like I am anywhere near where I want to be with this. But the more interest I can get, the more I can help you guys out there get learning, get started, get improving, the more we can help each other. So that's kind of what I want to do here. That said, resin printer. They are all fairly similar in that... They have what is called a vat, and this vat goes a resin. I'm showing this as an example. This is a stock resin by Serratech called Tenacious. This is one of our main ingredients in our custom blended industrial resins. This is anywhere from 75 to 100 bucks a kilogram. It goes quick. <laughs> it goes quicker if you're printing things that are not miniatures. So that goes in here. This is an anti-cubic mono printer, which prints fairly quick. And it comes with a vat that has your lines marked. I don't know if you can see that, but they are marked. You don't go past this one or when it's printing, it will splash out of there. Less of a splash, more of a just squish out of there. Anyway, when this is operating, what happens is this part here, while still attached to this, will go up and down. This is called a build plate. Your prints actually attach to the build plate and print from the bottom, from this little flat platform up. It will print from the bottom up. And it will do that for the various hundreds or thousands of layers for a file that is designed and then split into layers and put into a file meant to be read by the printers. 
There are a lot of different programs to do that. There are a lot of different ways to do that that are effective, some that are not. We will cover those in other videos. But for the basics, vat, resin goes in the vat. Build plate goes up and down out of the resin. There is a light in the underneath of here. That light projects and blocks to where only a certain part of the image is showing. So for something flat, this is this is a piece of braille, for something flat, the entire rectangle in there is a light bed. Without the file telling it anything, that entire rectangle is lit. This resin hardens when UV light hits it. What the file does is it blocks out the parts it doesn't need to where it will print only the part that you want. And it will do that for each layer. So that's how we end up with something like this braille where you have flat and then it just each layer down until there's dots. This says eagle skull. We'll talk about that in a minute. Actually, it says golden eagle. We'll talk about that in a minute. But that's the basic information about these printers. Now, a file does not get printed and come out all pretty like. To get a file like this, this is printed in a navy gray resin. This guy printed like this. Okay, these are called supports. Without these supports, this entire thing would be a blob. It would fail. It would not look anything like this. It would fail, and it would be a bunch of puddled plastic-looking material stuck on the film on the bottom of that vat that has to be scraped off and possibly replaced. When you got to replace the vat film, that's, that's also not cheap. But what you have to do is you have to go in here and clip every single one of these areas where the supports connect to the item. And see, he's lost a toe here. That's why he's in this group of examples instead of being clipped out. Is Since he doesn't have a toe, we'll use him to instruct. But every one of those has to be clipped out carefully. If you clip too hard or you drop it before it's ready, stuff will break. This has not been uh, further hardened. When they come out of here, they come off of the build plate. They get rinsed off in several different containers of alcohol. And what that does is, you know, the first one's really dirty. The next one's less. You do that until it's clean. Then you let it dry. And then you hit it for a couple of seconds with another UV light. And that hardens it the rest of the way. Or cures it the rest of the way, because you don't always want hard. You know, it's like these are... Our blend is fairly flexible. If you do this with a lot of the other resins, this will snap. It's taken us several years to get to this point where we don't have a lot of broken stuff. You clean them up and you get them to this point. Then you have to paint them or prime them. Now, because we went from gaming miniatures to working on interpretive pieces and educational pieces, we kind of followed the guidelines to print for miniatures, which was it doesn't really matter what color. You're going to spray it with black or white and then paint it. For getting into taxidermy and educational pieces, we have actually developed a mixture that is clear. It's a lot like what you would get if you molded and casted a piece. And so we've gone to more of that, especially with reptiles and fish, where you want some translucence. And honestly, at that point, you paint these the same way you would 
any other casting or replica, and they come out just fine. For example, however, I'm going to show you one here that was painted with a self-leveling um, miniature paint. Yeah, I think that's what we used on this one. It's one of, uh, by a company called Badger. Anyway, so this went from looking like this to this to this. Different poses, same concept. And then from here, this would be painted to look like a little black and green crow frog. Then used either for education or sprucing up a texture remount. We focus more on education and cultural center, nature center, museum, exhibit type pieces than we do trophies. As a child, I was quite enamored of the works done in the museums with the nice background mural paintings and things like that. So that's kind of the inspiration I've drawn from as I've continued learning as an adult. But that's how we get to there. And one of the really nice things about these two is you can do animals that are alive. That's a given. But you can also work with animals that are no longer alive, like this ammonite that's in progress here. And they did change shape through different periods as well. I don't remember off the top of my head which period this is, but this was a piece that I kind of shelved that I was working on earlier this year. And it started out in supports that were then cleared until it looked like this. Not all pieces print in one piece, so this will have to be put together and smoothed over. Not all print, uh, pieces print pretty. So you see there's holes in here. This is hollow inside, which created a little bit of problems when it printed. So all these have to go back and be filled in, just like if there were problems in a cast piece. This will have to come out. And when you're done, just like your cast pieces, you're never going to see it. It's going to be just another part of it. It also is useful for pieces someone can't possess. So, like this golden eagle skull. This is scanned and created into a file for printing off of a existing golden eagle skull that's in one of the collections that's used already used for education. So this one we have, you know, it's mostly whole on this side, but what we have on this side is this is cut away and a person could feel the inner workings in here. Why would we do something like that? Well, a raptor skull, like most birds, are kind of fragile. So you wouldn't really, even this one's a little fragile. This was before and during development of our more flexible resin formulas. But that aside, you wouldn't want a child getting a hold of and grabbing an actual raptor skull that's going to break. Or if you have somebody that's visually impaired, they might not be able to get a hold of it nicely without breaking it. And, you know, touching bones, oils, discoloration. You gotta think about um, preservation and conservation of artifacts being a factor and that can create a lot of instances where you wouldn't want somebody to be touching these. But if you have a print, you can encourage people to get in there and touch that and see how that feels, you know, how their olfactory senses would work. This is a piece I created as part of a project for an independent study class that does just that. And I was focused on working on materials for people with low vision or even no vision, 
which is when I got into printing Braille. This was meant to be a touch interpretive piece. And, you know, like I was saying earlier with printing the Braille, or with how the light works on the printer, when I was printing the Braille, this printed the flat layer and then each of the dots to read Golden Eagle. Uh, that's replica. Golden Eagle Skull Replica. And so that would be part of the item that they could touch and explore. You can understand, you know, their eating habits by their beak. You can understand how they would smell. How, how big, how good their vision would be. How big the eye area is. There's a lot you can tell from skulls that those who can see well might take for granted, but we're working to bridge those gaps. Might also use this for printing skulls in an area that, say, you can't have them. This is a scaled down, obviously, and not cleaned up, but this is a scaled down bear skull. This also gives you an idea a lot of those we call these support scars. Those have to be clipped off and filed down. Same thing was with this. Same thing is with every piece that I've ever done. Even the ones I've competed with. There's a lot of cleanup work. But we'll talk about that again in other videos. So back to skulls. You really like bears. You want a bear skull. Just to collect one. But you can't have them in your state. Here you go. Same with claws. Now there already are cast and replica claws out there and talons and things like that. There are some really good ones. But what if you could print it in your own home or you could take pictures of what you have and share that with someone else. Say your child shoots a bear. You're in a state you can have them. But you want to do a mount but they'd also like to have a necklace of a claw. That's not a problem. You can cast that claw or you can scan it in and print as many of them as you want. Painting gets a little tricky and admittedly I'm still learning with painting myself. This is another little raptor skull. Another little raptor skull. These are all these skulls are photo scans. They're off of existing skulls. We will talk more about photo scans in the future, but basically you have two main types of files. You have files that were modeled in a computer, which is another thing I'm still working on and admittedly very difficult and time consuming. Or you have existing items such as skulls, claws, mushrooms that you can take pictures of spend several hours in an editor putting those together to create a printable file. And then you also have artifacts. This is kind of a side category that you're not going to see much at home, but there are scanners we use in like paleo labs and things like that that will kind of run over the conjure of an item and copy artifacts, but that's that's another topic we'll consider getting into elsewhere. Speaking of mushrooms, so habitat. This is a photo scan of a morel with hair on it. That's not part of that. Anyway, a photo scan of a morel with all of its little nooks and crannies. Here's a bigger version. This is the same mushroom scale to different sizes, which is another thing you can do. This is this mushroom that had a print failure, so it kind of gloops together. And these, this is one of our most recent resins, and drop these all day long, they're not going to break. There's some chanterelles. These have already been cleaned up to be used in a project, so a lot of the support scars are gone. 
and they look pretty good. However, they had a flat bottom. So, that's where, I believe this is epoxy sculpt, or magic sculpt, one of the two I used here, probably magic sculpt. And, you just clay it and create like you would with any other piece. One thing 3D printing is not, is this is not a fix it, Button. This is not an easy button. This is not what some people would consider cheating. You will do a lot of work getting these where you want them. They don't come out in color. They don't come out ready to paint. They don't come out pretty. It's a lot of work. But they can spruce up your habitat. So, you know, turkey habitat with some mushrooms and some little snails. If you want to have a water frog in the mouth of a bass or something else that you're working on, you can do that with these. This is a this is a photo scan. And it's kind of hard to see in this color, I apologize. This is a photo scan of a water frog done by some folks overseas as part of an educational project. I will try to link to all of these, or as many of these as I can, below the video, but this is a photo scan. You can tell he was not alive when this was done. This was modeled off of a living subject. Now, this is a frog, this is a toad. Gonna be worlds of difference there. This was modeled off of a living subject. This was modeled out of uh, someone's brain because these don't exist anymore. This, I believe, is a photo scan. This is, of course, scaled down because this is the side of a tree. Along with having to remove these guys from supports, one of the other big things that you have to do if you're going to use these in, in a taxidermy piece, well, I guess you don't have to, but you could probably paint this guy up and put him as scenery in another piece if he's not your focus. In this piece here, he was my focus. So I wanted to get a lot of feedback. And I did. That was to improve my work and share with you all. Probably one of the biggest mistakes I made with this one is I painted most of him by brush. It's also a little bit of modeling error. A little bit of modeling error maybe with that leg, but... So, to go from this to this nicely, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's, there's cleanup. If you want to put in glass eyes, you have to dremel out the eyes. The nose still needs dremeled into to deepen that just like you would on a form or anything else if you want there to be nostril and things there like that. This is a little bit there just from the print process but that fills with paint quick. But there's a lot of work still yet to do. We can print photos too. So if you were going to do a skull mount or a euro we can take a photo. can't really see it I guess as well here. And we can 3D print, well, convert it into a file and 3D print their picture. But there's a lot of applications. But that's kind of a brief intro to 3D resin printing for taxidermy. We'll come back and look at 
some things a little more in depth in future videos, but I wanted to keep this one a little bit short. Thanks again. See you next time.